Hey, this is Anthony with MakeWeirdMusic.com, and I'm here with uh, Steve Ball all the way from Seattle, Washington. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Anthony, and great to talk to you again. Thank you. So uh, I know you've got 30 years of musical history, and there's so much to get into, but um, for the purposes of this interview, I think it'd be really cool if we could talk through the musical projects with which you've been recently associated with and are currently involved with. Awesome. Uh, that's a great lead in to, as you described, 30 years of interactions and collaborations that I've done that really go all the way back to something that your audience may be familiar with. And uh, I'm probably going to do some radical product placement during um, our quick talk tonight. But I was involved in the very early days of something called Guitar Craft. And these were a couple of the very early uh, musical recordings that came out of Guitar Craft. This one, in fact, I produced by hand at a place called Claymont in West Virginia. This was the very first uh, indie release uh, by the League of Crafty Guitarists called Get Crafty. It has uh, famously been unavailable on any modern formats, but since my early days of plugging in and being a crafty guitarist, I've done many other um, projects, both with the League from the beginning through multiple eras, all the way through a whole host of spin-off projects that kicked off in the uh, sort of second phase of Guitar Craft in 1991 after the League um, three-year tour fell apart because Robert and E.G. Records fell into a multi-year dispute. I formed a band in Los Angeles with my friends Sanford Ponder and we pulled in uh, some names that might be familiar to your audience, Pat Mastelotto, Nigel Gavin, and we recorded in 1991 and 92 a fairly proggy album called Prometheus. And around the same time, uh, there was a new band being born out of the first phase of uh, Guitar Craft called the California Guitar Trio. And I was there at the birth of uh, this as well. And this is one of the other spin off um, projects that is now going on, I think it's 25th anniversary, as Paul, Bert, and Hideo uh, are about to release their new album. Uh, as the California Guitar Trio. So I played with and even on a couple of the Cal early California Guitar Trio albums. And eventually I moved to Seattle and put together an independent outfit around 1993 called the Seattle Guitar Circle. And our primary mission, my primary mission with this project was to develop a completely independent entity so that if other guitar craft related activities happened or uh, business interactions with uh, Robert and guitar craft over the years, I wanted to have something that would be independent and available um, to sustain itself through whatever next gen changes that Robert and guitar craft needed to do. So the Seattle Guitar Circle was an, by design an independent project designed to continue the application and assimilation of what I learned from guitar craft uh, in a local context. And so I don't know if you can see some of the characters here are to this day still working and playing together in Seattle. In fact, I was with many of them. In fact, almost all of these characters were in a room last night at a Seattle Guitar Circle meeting, including Bob Williams, Jaxie Binder, Kurt Golden, Bill Rieflin was there as well, and Dean called in with a conflict, but the Seattle Guitar Circle is going on now 23 years of ongoing interactions in Seattle, essentially building on the same techniques that we learned from Robert Fripp and in Guitar Craft, involving improvisation, how to play in a group, and how to invite music into the present moment in a unique but reliable way. So there's a glimpse of some history, mostly based upon um, artifacts that people no longer buy. <laughs> However, as you know, I am still in the bad habit of organizing projects, groups, and uh, collaborations designed to bring music into the world on its own terms. And so, in fact, 
as you mentioned, one of my more recent projects just happened about a month ago. Uh, in fact, it was exactly a month ago that this small set of people started out with six uh, invitations for a core team that included, and I have to read this because if I do it from memory, I'll get the order wrong, but included Amy Denial, who is a local Seattle jazz and new music uh, master, Nigel Gavin, who is also a crafty guitarist from the early days uh, and an amazing guitarist in his own right from New Zealand, uh, Nora Germain, who is a jazz violinist from Los Angeles, who is a force of nature, and she is plowing ahead uh, in an amazing career already in Los Angeles as a phenomenal jazz violinist. Paul Richards from the California Guitar Trio, uh, one of my best guitar craft buddies, and we've been collaborating for 30 years now. Petra Hayden, who was sort of one of the surprise wild cards, and Petra is the daughter of Charlie Hayden, one of the jazz world's premier uh, and revered uh, bass players. And Petra is one of three daughters who are part of the Hayden triplets. But Petra has a voice uh, that can melt glass at 100 meters. Uh, and so this core team was joined by about 20 other guitarists, instrumentalists, and celebrities from around the country, and we came together for a week of work, and the odd and maybe funny um, instigation was fairly open-ended in that no one really knew what they were getting themselves into. But what we did is, in three days, we essentially assembled a repertoire and did a show we showed up on a Sunday and we did a show on a Wednesday night at a place called The Chapel in Seattle, which is a well-known uh, jazz and new music venue in the Good Shepherd Center in Wallingford. And we wrote and improvised our way through about 90 minutes of music for a show two days after we had essentially just met. And then... We went into one of Seattle's most famous recording studios, a place called London Bridge, where the early Pearl Jam records were recorded, and a whole mess of albums that most of the world knows about. And we locked out London Bridge, and for three days, we took this set of world-class musicians, and we recorded the repertoire we developed in the first three days, and we improvised for a couple of days with guest producers who were invited to come in and arrange or invent or discover something with this set of world-class musicians uh, in the moment. And so we had Trey Gunn and Bob Williams and Carl Germain and Dean Jensen um, uh, stand up in front of this group of world-class musicians and they orchestrated something out of nothing. And now we have about six hours of music that I'm beginning to sort through so that this tiny orchestral moments project will move from a wild harebrained idea, mostly inspired by Nigel and Paul Richards saying they wanted to come to Seattle to do a project, and it will likely evolve into three, maybe four CDs, as well as something that no one saw coming. But we also had a set of documentary filmmakers who were there at the Wednesday night show, and then they were with us for three days in London Bridge with cameras everywhere, interviewing everyone involved and asking questions that I mostly uh, worked hard to not listen to the answers uh, but there's a documentary being made about the entire project, and I'm going to use one of my GoPros to give you an alt shot to just show you. The documentary filmmakers um, last year released a film called Bazango, Washington, which is an amazing documentary uh, by Ron Austin and Louise uh, Amandes, who decided to document the early days of the Northwest cartoon and comic art community which includes Matt Groening, Linda Berry, and a whole slew of 
amazing um, cartoon artists from the Northwest. So they came in and are now sorting through hours and hours of footage from the project and their mission is, as far as I understand it, is to tell the story of the project. And so all of this unfolded over the last month um, and I will say that musically there were unexpected surprises and some amazing uh, improvised compositions that unfolded from these collaborations and maybe I'll just shut up and maybe I'll just play you a little bit of something I've been mixing um, to give you a sense of maybe what this project was. Very cool. Uh, I think before, uh, right before you played the show, a couple names got added to that roster as well. Julie Slick was added, and was there somebody else? Yeah, uh, there were actually three or four significant late additions. Um, Friday before the project was going to begin on Sunday, I heard from Amy Denio that she could only make the first half of the project because she had landed a gig in Turkey and she was flying out of the country to go play with her regular band called Culture Shock, an amazing uh, internationally known band. Um, and so Amy was going to disappear and rather than have a gap in this sort of core of three men and three women, this sort of balanced, um, chemically um, explosive combination of uh, players, I decided to call up Julie, who I had collaborated with um, last year, two years ago. Uh, I played on Julie's record, Pi, which is also an amazing uh, piece of music with a ton of collaborations. But I called up Julie and, um, with two days notice, invited her to Seattle, and she said yes, and she showed up on Tuesday to join us with only a day of prep for the Wednesday night show and for three days in the studio. That's and amazing. her presence was also both phenomenal and looking back, not only did she gel complete with, with the personalities in the team, but musically she had a massive impact on the repertoire, the sound, the feel, and of course the uh, energy of all of the music that happened. Cool. And in addition, uh, Julie also uh, was a late-breaking addition, but I also invited a crafty guitarist who I had met and played with in the orchestra of crafty guitarists named Patrick Grant. Patrick is another powerhouse musician who has organized a project called Tilted Axes, which is a, um, it's a music for mobile electric guitars project that goes into cities and with small portable amplifiers like this, they strap on both a guitar and an amp and they wander around cities with sometimes 10 to 20 to 30 electric guitarists playing both composed and improvised music in unlikely locations. And so when I met Patrick, we hit it off. And so I invited Patrick out to join us and he also showed up on Tuesday afternoon, joined us literally off the plane into the dress rehearsal, and played piano and electric guitar, and also radically changed both the character, uh, the flavor, and the outcome of the music. And I'd say there's two other significant additions. One was uh, Eileen Bunch, um, who is a, also a longtime crafty guitarist and a member of Patrick's Tilted Axis group. She was here for another project that had happened a couple of weeks earlier where a small team of people decided to take a very famous piece of guitar craft repertoire called Eye of the Needle, which has been played for 30 years in all sorts of guitar craft environments. And there was a set of people who decided to work on a vocal only version, an a cappella version of this piece called Eye of the Needle. So Eileen was here for that, and she heard about the project, and she decided to stay. And she contributed some amazing uh, keyboards and piano parts and singing as well to the uh, project. And finally, Nigel Gavin, 
uh, brought with him uh, his uh, girlfriend named Sonia Wilson, who had just come from New York where she was doing merchandise for Suzanne Vega, who um, w is on tour right now, and I think even Suzanne's coming to Seattle in a couple weeks. Sonia turned out to be another wild card who contributed with her voice and with her ukulele and with her presence an entirely lovable and grounded uh, set of music and collaborations to the entire event that also uh, changed the nature of how and what we did. So we had this combination of, it started out with six core, sort of three men, three women. In the end, it was sort of a core team of about five men and five women, also surrounded by the very talented and experienced and hardworking Seattle Guitar Circle. So on top of that, we had close to 20 additional contributors um, and Trey Gunn and Dan Moore, uh, who all brought their own craft and their own years and years of work with improvisation uh, to the team. And the results, I'm just beginning to do the mixing now, but the results are all over the map from Zappa like experimental to cluster filled Glen Bronca like um, unfolding chaos to deeply moving. Um, orchestrated uh, knot work with vocals that appear from nowhere all the way to this piece that I'll just play you now. This was a piece that unfolded in the very first day, the very first rehearsal Monday morning when we got together in this house, this Airbnb where we all stayed for the week. And this is a piece called Spiritual that unfolded without conversation, without planning, without any real homework, and the entire group essentially went from silence to what I'm about to play for you. And just to give you a little glimpse, I'll play a few minutes to give you a sense of this unfolding improvisation that turned into this uh, beautiful song that is coincidentally written by Petra's brother, Josh Hayden. So there is an actual thread of a real composition here, but the entire arrangement folded and arrived out of the sky. And it sounds like this. while this is playing, I'll give you a little tour of my studio to complement what's going on.
there's a little glimpse of one small corner of the collaborations that happened with this set of people. And I'll give you a wave version that doesn't have the right, my right channel um, making futzy sounds so you can no get a pure version there. But that's a little glimpse of uh, the kinds of projects that I am deeply motivated to continue hosting, uh, sponsoring, and releasing. Uh, my, my primary mission is to bring groups of people together who can make things together that they would otherwise not do on their own. And obviously a long history of this, if you go back to the early league, to Los Gauchos Alemanes, to Seattle Guitar Circle, to Electric Gauchos, to um, this latest project, Tiny Orchestral Moments. And be happy to unveil and share little bits and pieces of some of the corners of these collaborations with you and your audience if you're up for that over the next couple of months. Sounds great. Where can they go to get more information as it unfolds? Eventually, there will be a Tiny Orchestral Moments website. Today, there is a Facebook group called Tiny Orchestral Moments. So if you're on Facebook, the best way to learn a little bit and see some of the videos that have poured off of cell phones and off of um, or out of the team members of the project so far, uh, you'll probably get the best updates there in the short term. When we release the documentary and the probably three CDs that will include songs like the one you just heard, complete improvisations that are all over the map in terms of structure and feel, and some of the producers' tracks. Trey, for example, had the team divided into instrumentalists on one side and vocalists on the other side of the room, and he orchestrated uh, sort of a collaboration and counterpoint between vocals and instruments. Uh, so there's a whole set of experimental producer sessions that will probably end up on its own disc as well. So for starters, I would say if you're on Facebook, find the Tiny Orchestral Moments group. And there's a, a, a huge amount of photos and some cool videos to check out there. And then I would say watch Make Weird Music uh, for ongoing updates. Uh, or you can go to steveball.com where there is often um, more information than um, should rightly be in one place on all of this stuff. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. I look forward to uh, unraveling even more of your musical history over follow-up conversations. So thanks a lot for sharing your time with us. Awesome. My pleasure and look forward to ongoing conversations. Thank you, Anthony. Cool.